our Lady Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti, delighted to pray with you the sixth Sunday in ordinary time. Let's pray together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. With your spirit. And let's take a moment to consider our sins and ask for God's mercy. We are called on to be people of love. God is love, we're told in sacred scripture. For the times we fail to love as we should, especially in our own families, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We're called on to be courageous in living out the faith. For the times we are tepid in living our faith. For the times we lack the courage to say we belong to Jesus, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And for the good we mean to do, the good intentions that are not realized, the sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks to your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father, amen. And so we pray. Let us pray that everything we do will be guided by God's law to love one another. God our Father, you have promised to remain forever with those who do what is just and loving and right. Help us to live always in your divine presence. And we ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The first reading, a reading from the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, if someone has on his skin a scab or a pustule or blotch, which appears to be the sore of leprosy, he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of the priests among the, his descendants. If the man is leprous and unclean, the priest shall declare him unclean, by reason of the sore of, on his head. The one who bears the sore of leprosy shall keep his garments rent and his head bare and shall muffle his beard. He shall cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as the sore is on him, he shall declare himself unclean, since he is in fact unclean. He shall dwell apart, making his abode outside the camp. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I covered not. I said, 
I confess my faults to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. I turn to you, Lord, in times of trouble, and you fear me with the joy of salvation. the Lord and rejoice you just exalt up you upright of heart I turn to you Lord in times of trouble and you fill me with the joy of salvation reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Avoid giving offense, whether to the Jews or Greeks or the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in every way, not seeking my own benefit, but that of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. The word of the Lord. the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. A le leper came to Jesus and kneeling down, begged him and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. Move with pity. Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him and said to him, I do will it, and made him clean. The leprosy left him immediately, and he was made clean. Then, warning him sternly, Jesus dismissed him at once. And he said to him, See that you tell no one anything, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. The man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. He spread the report abroad so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly. He remained outside in deserted places, and people kept coming to him from everywhere. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us on this sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. Wonderful readings, very applicable to your life and mine. Let's go to the Old Testament first, the book of Leviticus. A couple of things about the, the lepers that we hear about there. First of all, a great misunderstanding back then which I'm going to suggest we continue to live in some ways, was the idea that if a person had leprosy, which you know was uh, not a curable condition back then, it was going to lead to death, and they lived a horrible life, cut off from society, they looked horrible because they needed medical care that was not given to them, there was no medical care back then that really worked. So leprosy was a death sentence, but it also was a rejection socially. You were outcast. People believed back then that if you were afflicted with a disease like that, it must be your fault or the fault of your forebears, that somehow or another God was paying you or your relatives back by giving you this terrible disease, that when bad things happen to people, it must be that they deserve them because something in their life was askew. Some sin had been committed. They did something wrong that ticked God off, and they were wrong. 
God doesn't work that way. God doesn't send affliction to people to make a point. Affliction happens, but it's not sent to us by God. Now, I mentioned to you there's a connection to our modern age, because I think even though we've made so many advances, the truth is that's an area where we haven't made advances. We still secretly, I think a lot of us, have in our minds and hearts this idea that if something bad happens to you, it's God's payback. As if we have a God up there sitting there with his ledger saying, okay, you committed 10 sins, I'm going to give you a good whack for that one by sending you this particular difficulty. I don't know who your God is, but the God I read about, the God I pray to, is a God of mercy and love who wants us not to suffer. In fact, he got on the cross to spare us all suffering and death. So this whole concept back then was wrong, but it continues to exist a bit in our age. A time in which we sometimes believe that if bad things happen, we must somehow deserve it because of the nature of our sin. That's the one thing I wanted to mention. And the other thing is just to keep in mind that while the lepers were the outcasts of that age, we continue to have outcasts, people who we really don't want to be around, people who we reject because they're not like us, people who are socially or ethnically or religiously different from us, and so we keep our distance. And that tendency to push people away, to decide that there are some people who we want nothing to do with, doesn't say great things about us. And I think the challenge of this reading is to say, who are the outcasts for you and me? Who are the people we avoid? Who are the people we look down on? Who are the people we want nothing to do with? And then ask yourself, if they are equally ch children of God like you and me, how do we dare to decide that some people are worthy of our time and our presence in their lives, and some people are not? How would we feel if God said, no, 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 Jim, sorry, you're not part of our group, and so I cast you out. I want nothing to do with you. I'd be desperate to get back in God's favor. Well, those outcasts want to be part of our family, too. And our job is to first identify who are the outcasts in my life, and then how can I break down the, the barriers of prejudice and bias and that arrogance that keeps us saying, oh no, there's some people in my circle and there are other people I must cast out. You know, uh, there's a great book by Nico Kazantzakis, who is famously known for writing Zorba the Greek. But another book he wrote that's worth reading is called St. Francis. You know, St. Francis of Assisi was a great saint who loved not only everybody, but he also loved all the animals. He's the patron saint of, of our pets as well. But apparently, the one thing Francis wasn't able to tolerate was that very issue of leprosy. That when he'd hear the bell ringing, unclean, unclean, a leper is coming, he'd be the first person to run. And he was challenged by God in prayer. Francis, until you let in the person you are most inclined to shut out, you can never be a friend of Christ. And so there's a beautiful scene in the book called St. Francis by Kazantzakis, where he hears the bell coming, and he decides to face his fear and to stop shutting out this man he has always kept at a distance because he's a leper. And Francis breaks down the wall and actually embraces the man with the bell who is filled with leprosy. In that moment, Kazantzakis writes, suddenly the leper is a leper no more. And Francis finds himself embracing Christ himself. The message to us is very clear. That leper, that person you cast out, that person you want nothing to do with, that rejected person is, in fact, another version of Christ himself. And if we don't want to reject Jesus, and who wants to reject Jesus, how then do we reject Jesus' brothers and sisters, those people we have cast out, the people we consider outcasts, the one we want nothing to do with? Okay, let's go to that second reading. St. Paul to the Corinthians. Here's in three words what he's getting at. And it's an interesting and a tough challenge for me. Maybe it is for you. St. Paul says, avoid giving offense. Avoid giving offense. You want to be holy? I want to be holy. Avoid giving offense. How do we offend? Oh, in so many ways. Certainly by shutting people out, going back to the first reading, deciding some people are worthy of our time and love and attention. Some people are not. But there are so many other ways in our culture where we offend people. I was just thinking of all the words we use to describe others that are appallingly bad and sinful. 
So, you know, now we're at a time in which we've moved and advanced so that now people wouldn't dare say the N-word, right? It's completely rejected by society. But for generations, people reduced black people to that N-word. And there's a great example of what St. Paul means when he said, avoid giving offense. But it happens not just toward people who are black. There's a nickname for every culture, every group of people who are not like us. And somehow or another, we think that because they're not like us, we have the right to make up these names for them that in the end just show disregard and disrespect for other people who are equally children of God. So you've got to ask yourself, as I've got to ask myself, when I'm told by St. Paul to avoid giving offense, even if I never say it to the person who is of a different culture or religion or color, just the fact that I think those words or that I say them to my friends is a sign that I do give offense, that I violate St. Paul's precept by treating other people as lesser than me or my people because they're different. To avoid giving offense. How about this? I wish I could count every time I get in my car the number of people I see who get angry on the road, and I do too sometimes, but one thing I try never to do is what I see all the time. People do something wrong in their car, and they don't like what you did, and they give you the middle finger. Do you know what the middle finger is? Of course you do. That is a classic example to me of giving offense. Well, next time you're driving, tie that middle finger to, to the steering wheel if you have to. But do not do offensive things to other people because by avoiding offensive things, we are on the road to holiness, St. Paul says. But by giving in to the cursing and the names and the nicknames we say for others, the things that indicate bias and prejudice, by the way in which we give signals with our hand and our fingers that we have great disregard for other people because we don't like the way they drive, we're giving offense. There are so many ways we have found cleverly to give offense. You see political candidates who become masters of reducing their opponents by coming up with a nickname for them. And you know and I know who I'm talking about. And that's just one more sign of denigrating another person, taking their whole life and reducing them to a joke, to a sign of disrespect. St. Paul says you want to be holy, you want to be in God's favor, avoid giving offense. Hard to do, important to try. And finally, let's go to this gospel. So there's a leper who comes to Jesus. Jesus heals him. And it's, we're told in the reading beautifully, the, the source of Jesus' healing is his compassion. When he sees somebody who's hurting, when he sees somebody who's carrying a heavy burden, when he sees someone who's been rejected by others, when he sees someone who has faced great intolerance and bias and bigotry, what does Jesus do? He is moved with compassion. He's moved with pity. Now, you may not have the burden, thank God, of leprosy, but every one of us has stuff that others reject. Every one of us has things that are not perfect in us that other people would make a joke about or denigrate or treat with disregard and disrespect. We have a Jesus who says, whatever the burden is you carry, whatever is the reason that people have rejected you, just know I don't. And in fact, I have toward you ongoing and eternal compassion. I love you. And in the sign of your weakness that the world rejects, I see an opportunity to love you even more profoundly. Can you imagine if we all did that? When we see somebody who's hurting or different or not like us, we see somebody who's carrying a heavy burden. Instead of making fun of them or rejecting them or walking away or turning our back on them, we did what Jesus did. I will you to be well, and the reason I decide to cure you is because in my heart I'm hurt with you, because I have compassion. That is what you and I, who call ourselves Catholic Christians who are emulators of Christ, are called to do, to try to see other people with all their burdens as a call to compassion. And that's what he did. There's just one more thing in this gospel. I promise I'll wrap it up after this, but I just love it. So Jesus is pretty strict here. You keep quiet about this healing. I don't want anyone to know about it. This is between you and me. And then we're told in the final paragraphs of the gospel, the man couldn't shut up. He went and told everybody, you're not going to believe it. I was a leper, and he cured me. He healed me. The man could not shush up about the extraordinary experience 
of meeting and experiencing the love of Christ. Now, at one level you could say, hey, he didn't do what Jesus told him to do. He's going to be in big trouble. But I think Jesus understands. A man has carried leprosy. He's been a total rejected person by society. He's been given a disease that will kill him painfully. Along comes Jesus, who because of compassion heals him. He can't keep quiet. What I'm saying is if you know Christ, if I know Christ, then it's really impossible to make it a private matter. Well, I'm a Catholic Christian, but I try not to let anyone know. Why not? I belong to Jesus. I got the best God in the whole world. He loves me. He loves me unconditionally. He sees me with all my problems. He's moved with compassion to help me. How could I ever keep silent about that? Have you ever been in love? Or even the love you have for your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your child? You're so proud, right? If I could have a dime for every grandparent who takes out their cell phone now and says, do you want to see my grandchildren? Do you want to see the pictures of my great-grandchildren? I really don't, but I do anyway, because I know they're so filled with excitement. They're so in love with their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and they can't keep quiet. They will force you to look at thousands of pictures of their kids doing what kids do because they just love them so much. This man did that in the gospel. I love this Jesus who's given me another life, and I can't keep quiet about it. If nobody knows that you belong to Jesus, because you never talk about it, you never show it, you never try to explain to people that you are who you are, richly blessed because of your friendship with Jesus, then maybe we're being too quiet for bad reason. We're not that proud to belong to Jesus, but we should be. I want you to love Jesus the way you love other people in your life. And just as I hope you never keep silent in telling them and others how much the love means, so too our love for Jesus and his profound effect on our lives should make us unwilling to be silent, but rather to tell the whole world, I am blessed to be loved by the best. As a people of faith, let's profess our creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And with trust and confidence in that same loving and compassionate God, we offer now our prayers of petition. And the response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That the church may be an instrument of God's mercy through her mission and outreach to those most in need, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That the world and local leaders may seek the poor and forsaken, giving them the dignity and assistance they deserve as children of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That church leaders may bear witness to God's gift and plan for marriage, and assist couples to live that vocation faithfully, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Patricia Valdaro, Myrene Burleson, Paulette Sewell, Patricia Carbone, Nancy Joyce, Babies Carmela and Liliana, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Joseph Peter Reef Jr., John P. P. 
Peonies, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the attention of this Mass, deceased members of the Capello family, Anne and Frank Karowski, St. Joseph Book of Remembrance, Daniel M. Doherty, Genevieve Cavaretta, Cecilia DiMartino, Marie Ione, Philocles J. DeRoches, Gladys Henry, whom we remember at the Eucharist, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. And let me add some intentions if I can now. Among those who are sick, I ask your special prayers and concern for Jose Joe Sena, for Glenn Hudson, for Joe Falgiano. I want to pray for Bertica of Seattle, who's going to get the results of a biopsy. So, Bertica, we're praying for you in a special way. We pray for Tom Slade, Kathy Bodengo, Judge Anthony Falanga, Eddie Mullins. I pray for Mary O'Brien and Tommy Burke, Tom and Patty Yanch, Katie O'Connor, Angelo and Al Clementi. Pray for Leanne Lasanti, Kimberly Cusack, Christine Bauman, Michelle Leonhardt, Russell Castro Giovanni. Pray for Vincent Rienzi Jr. Among the sick, I pray for Roy Citrano and Sam Maggio. I pray for Susie and Vinny Vignardi, for Rosalie Salco, for Richard Monaco, for Herb Stouter, for Judy Alaco. I pray for Larry Meyer and Richard Cardone, for Janice Chevelle and Robert Telasca. I pray for Thomas Mistretta and Michael Hellam. I pray for Carmela Catherine and Lillianne Marie, two uh, preemies born twins for their continued growth and well-being. I pray for Michael who's suffering from leukemia and for Sandra Slater, as well as for Anne Marie de Blasio and Linda Madridge, Dario Rivera, Carol Paula Ashandi, Kelly Lee Schibalia. I pray for Virginia Rivera, Barbara and Ken Barsanti, for Marie and Ken Johnson and their family, for Tommy Swingros, for Sarah Sally Belfi, and for Gussie Sino, and for Paula Sewell. Paula is waiting for a liver um, uh, tra transplant. And among those I want to pray for too, let me pray for Jerry Schreiber, who's recovering from liver and kidney transplant, and for his well-being as well. And uh, I think that covers everybody among the sick. And among those who have died, let me mention a couple of people that I'd like you especially to pray for. Please, if you could, to pray for Richard Jennings and Craig Scott and Bessie and TC Center and Thomas Minter. Thomas is that four-year-old who passed. And I always pray for Thomas's family, especially that they will find consolation. For Roland Rossi and Jenna Tuller, for Margie Smith and Tessie Palmo. I pray for Phil Corderaro, Frankie Cazetto, Billy and Michael Sarasoli, their dad, also Billy Sarasoli, Ray and Monica Carrison. I pray for Margaret O'Connor Lasanti, for Bridget Clementi, for Cecilia and Nicholas Lasanti, for Irene and Tom Romano, for Ed June and Eddie Jandovitz, for Beverly Maggio, for Regina Brightman, Brighton, pardon me, for Justino Joe Amarin, for Tom Sully O'Sullivan, for Alfred John Sicali, for Emilio Alaco, for Paul Struzzieri, Maria and Albert Cavelli, Anna and Gary Gomes, for all the deceased members of the Vignardi family, for Diana Mistretta, James and Rita Volpe, Joseph Sardone, uh, Gina Pelletier, Emily Lafaso, James or Jim uh, Babrowski. I pray for Chris Baumler, for Betty Moore, for Pauline Romano, for uh, Sylvia Christ, for Beatrice Ferrari, for Millie Paradiso and Mary Rockensees, for James C. Williams, for Suzanne Scanio and Brian Hussey, for Annette Salinitro, for Judge Donald Belfi, for Thomas Peter Lopresti, for Joseph Wellweber. Joseph was a young man who died way too soon. Today is the fifth anniversary of his passing, so we pray for Joe in heaven. We pray for Dennis and Joe Cooney, two brothers who passed away seven months apart. For Richard Jennings and uh, again, Jamie Scotto, wonderful woman who went through so very much, and we pray for the consolation of her family. For Pam Amodio, 
as well as uh, Pauline McKenzie's parents. And I'd like to, if I can, add a few intentions to the ones I've already mentioned. Among the sick, I want to remember to pray for all the members of the uh, uh, Paratine and McShay family down in Charlotte, North Carolina. I want to pray for Sal Manzo and Larry Lewis and Velia Bronzini. I pray for Jack Campbell. Uh, he's down in Jensen Beach in Florida, and we're praying for his recovery. And for Mrs. Kalinowski, and for Linda and Frank Rosado. And among the sick, I'm praying for Ben Seminella, as well as uh, George Rumi, and for Ralph Woythaler, my friend down in Florida, also facing some challenging times. And then there are um, a few people who have passed away. I want to remember them uh, added to my list here, if you'll bear with me. I want to pray for Rosalie Salko. Remember, we've had Rosalie on the sick list, and she's gone to heaven now. I want to pray as well for Gussie Sino and for John, Helen, and Luke Marr. And then I just got a few more in the past couple of days. So here's one I want to ask for your special prayers, too, among the sick. Uh, please add Cora Tess Wilson to your prayer list. She is 10 years old, and she's battling a form of thyroid cancer. Uh, so we're praying for that 10-year-old Cora Tess Wilson, and I, I thank Claire for sending that. Uh, I also want to pray for my friend Rosemarie Cardone, who was caretaker for her husband Richard, and like so many people, he is challenged by uh, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, and uh, that's a burden for him, Richard, but also for Rosemarie and all those who care for those who are sick. Um, among those we're asked to pray for, I want to pray for Darlene DeChico, uh, who has taken a bad fall while walking her dog last week, and she broke her wrist and her hip. So we play from, pray for my good friend Darlene and her recovery. And then just a, a promise, a little bit more. Yeah, when I was in high school, I had Sister Ascension Lynch, Dominican sister, great teacher, and her sister, who's a twin, uh, Sister Jonathan Lynch, passed away this week. Um, so I pray for Sister Jonathan Lynch, OP, member of the Order of Preachers, and then finally, remember we were praying for those twins who were about to be born, Carmela and Liliana, well, they're born. And uh, they were born January 24th, and they've been in uh, NICU uh, ahead of them because of their, you know, being born prematurely and having some challenges. But please pray for those babies, Carmela and Liliana. As always, I pray for all of our friends who are oppressed around the world, especially our friends in Taiwan and Hong Kong and Ukraine. I pray for peace in the Holy Land. I pray for all of our men and women in the armed forces, and I pray for our first responders, police, firefighters, and EMTs. I pray for our doctors and nurses and orderlies and all those trying to keep us healthy. And I pray for your special intentions in mind. Join me in giving them over to the Mother of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord God, we make this offering in obedience to your divine word. May it cleanse us and renew us and lead us to our eternal reward. And we ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father in heaven, it is right that we should give you thanks and glory. You are the one God, living and true. Through all eternity, you live in unapproachable light, source of life and goodness. You have created all things to fill your creatures with every blessing and lead all people to the joyful vision of your divine light. Countless hosts of angels stand before you to do your will. They look upon your splendor and they praise you night and day. United with them and in the name of every creature under heaven, we too praise your glory as together we pray. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we acknowledge your greatness. All your actions show your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own likeness and you set us over the whole world to serve you, our creator, and to rule over all creatures. And even when we disobeyed you and lost your friendship, you did not abandon us to the power of death, but helped all people to seek and to find you. Again and again, you offered a covenant to us and through the prophets taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you so loved the world that in the fullness of time, you sent your only son to be our savior. He was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, a man like us in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, to those in sorrow joy. In fulfillment of your will he gave himself up to death, but by destroying death and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored us to eternal life and that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him. He sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as his first gift to those who believe, to complete his work on earth and to bring us all the fullness of grace. Father, may this same Holy Spirit now bless and sanctify these offerings. Let them become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He always loved those who were his own in the world, and when the time came for him, to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, he showed the depth of that love. While they were at supper, Jesus took bread. He blessed the bread and broke it. He gave it to his friends, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Father, we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption. We recall Christ's death, his descent among the dead, his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And looking forward to his coming again in glory, we, 
we offer you his body and blood, the acceptable sacrifice which brings salvation to the whole world. Lord, look upon this sacrifice which you've given to your church, and by your Holy Spirit, gather all who share this one bread and one cup into the one body of Christ, a living sacrifice of praise. Lord, remember those for whom you offer this sacrifice, especially Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. Remember those who take part in this offering, those here present, and all your people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember those who have died in the peace of Christ, and all the dead, all the dead whose faith is known to you alone. Father, in your mercy, grant also to us, your children, to enter into our heavenly inheritance, in the company of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with St. Joseph, her devoted spouse, and with all the saints and martyrs and angels. And then, in your kingdom, freed from the corruption of sin and death, we shall sing your glory with every creature through Christ our Lord, through whom you give us everything that is good. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen, 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 amen. lepers in your life? Who are the outcasts? Who are people we don't want to be around? We reject them. They're not like us. We look down on them. We don't want to look them in the eyes. They're not one of us. Clearly, all these readings show us there's no room in the Christian heart for treating anyone like an outcast, treating anyone with disrespect, that you and I will have a change of heart and treat everyone as we would want to be treated that we will look at each person just as Jesus does, with love and compassion. And that hope, let's say the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, who take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body 
and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. our spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you, amen. Not too many announcements, except you know and I know, I hope you do, that uh, coming up this next Wednesday is going to be Ash Wednesday, the beginning of our 40 days of Lent, a special time of prayer and repentance and directing our lives in a new and wonderful direction. So uh, don't miss the importance of Ash Wednesday, an opportunity to change the direction of our lives, to walk away from the bad stuff and more fully embrace the good. Uh, in your own local church, you'll have the distribution of ashes as we have multiple opportunities here at Our Lady of Lourdes on this coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. And, and don't just use it as a day to go get ashes, which is great, I'm glad you all come, but as an opportunity to say, okay, I will redirect my life. I'll use these 40 days as days of prayer to transform the things that are rot rotten in my life into the good and to take the stuff that's good in my life and make it even better. So please, please use this season of Lent in a special way to become all that God wants us to be. As always, I welcome you to be with us on Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Musanti. If you have Sirius XM, you go to channel 129, the Catholic channel, and we're on three times on Sunday. Or if you have a computer, you just go to uh, the, the heading and you punch in YouTube and put in Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Musanti. This week, our guest is Christopher Bell. This is a great guy who worked for years at Covenant House. And one thing he noticed with those homeless kids coming in is that a lot of them were pregnant and had no place to go. So he, with Father Benedict Rochelle, founded the wonderful thing called Good Council Homes. And it's been miraculous to offer people in crisis pregnancies a place to come and find safety and a, a home for them and their babies and all the help they need. So it's a great testimony of what one person can do if you set yourself on the right path. Christopher Bell is the guest this week, and next week is Matt Brown. There's a great new film called Freud's Last Session. Freud is played by Anthony Hopkins, and uh, he debates C.S. Lewis, who's played by uh, Matthew Good. Well, C.S. Lewis, as you probably know, was a great apologist for the Christian faith, uh, and was very articulate about why he believed in Jesus. And Freud, on the other hand, was a devout atheist, so it's a great movie about the debate between the two of them about the existence of God and why there's evil in the world. So Matt Brown directed this new film that I hope you'll see, but also Matt Brown, wonderful film director, but also really, really nice man. He's our guest next week. So this week, Christopher Bell. Next week, Matt Brown, director of Freud's Last Session on Personally Speaking. My friends, let's continue to pray. Lord Jesus, give us food from heaven, and may we always hunger for the true bread of life. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you and your families. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.